Okay. All right. We're ready to go. Uh, we let me go ahead and introduce Francisco Cabañas. He is a core team member. Goes by Arctic Mine, not Arctic Mine, like it's actually spelled, but Arctic Mine. I mean, maybe he'll maybe he'll talk about that. Maybe not. Maybe we're more interested in his thing that, uh, on the adaptive block weight. So let's give him a great big hand. Thank you so much for coming, and tell us all about this whole scaling thing. Okay. So what I'm gonna talk about is uh, an aspect of Monero that is generally not discussed very commonly, but it's quite unique to Monero, and in fact makes Monero one of the few, or maybe the only viable uh, proof of work cryptocurrency. So, okay, let's see, you guys there, yeah, there we go. So this is an overview of the talk today, we're looking at uh, block weight versus block size, rational miners and users, fee and block weight, return of the rational miner, we'll go back to that question, and then we'll look at the, at the scenarios as to what happened when the block reward goes to zero, the elephant in the room for a lot of very major coins, and what the implications are for both Monero and also for Bitcoin. Bitcoin la likes more like uh, block weights, and also the Satoshi fee market. So the first overview is block weight versus block size in Monero. Block weight was introduced in Monero at the same time as bulletproofs, and the main reason is because verification time scales as the log, uh, while, sorry, it scales as linear, while the proof size scales as base to log. And so what we wanted to do is to ensure that you're pricing verification time properly uh, to prevent certain types of attacks. So for a two out output transaction, we define the transaction weight equals to the transaction size. For more than two outputs, we take 80% of the savings, we take claw it back, and then we grows up the weight, and so the weight is the block size plus these clawbacks. And the idea basically is to ensure that you're pricing correctly. Uh, most people confuse them, including, and it's easy to do that, but that's essentially what that is about. Everything I talk about will be block weights as far as the penalty functions are concerned, etc. So that's where we go from there. So what is a rational miner? Well, well, the assumption here is very simple. We have a rational miners and rational users. They're interacting in what is known as a free market, and they're acting in their best enlightened self-interest. They're not altruistic, they're not malicious. The miner wants the maximum return, the user wants to pay the lowest fee, and they're interacting in a free market. So the problem is you have a finite number of transactions in the, in the transaction pool, and you're a miner. You have a certain distribution of fees and weights, and then you've got to figure out which ones are you going to put in the block. You want to maximize your cost. So, sorry, ma maximize your return, and you want to minimize the cost of the user. The full problem is actually a discrete op optimization problem that can be solved exactly. It's a big, huge matrices. But basically, what it is, is you've got to find the optimal transaction mix. So, if we look at... This, the, the actual review of how block and weight scaling works in Monero, and this is what makes Monero fundamentally different from Bitcoin. So any ideas that you have from Bitcoin, or from Bitcoin Cash, or from Litecoin, um, about fees and block sizes, you have to throw them all out. Because what drives Monero's fees, and its adaptive block size limit, is the penalty. And it's the penalty that you pay to to add a, a minor block that is higher in block weight than the median. So if you increase the block size, you pay a penalty and you lose a portion of your block reward. And that's the key thing. So the key for, for, uh, numbers, of course, is MB is the uh, transaction block weight. Then you have the MS is a short-term median, which is the old median. ML is a long-term median. And, and that's a recursive calculation, and MN is the minimum of the two mediums, sorry, MN is the minimum of the, med the short-term medium and the ML, which is the long-term medium. Okay. I should point out these slides are available for download uh, from, the, uh, um, from the site, so you can actually get them if you miss something. So base is your base reward, 
And the reward base to the minor basically is in the US R base my minus uh, R base times this formula, the penalty formula. Uh, if you mine a block which is twice the size of the median, you got nothing in, in block uh, in uh, um, in fees. Sorry, in, in um, block rewards. So your fees have to compensate you for that. And the main change in 2019 was the introduction of the long-term median. Uh, and then the idea behind the long-term median was to cap the short-term median of 50 times the long-term median and it's an anti-spam measure while at the same time allowing for long-term scaling and also allowing for a burst to accommodate a seasonal uh, increase in um, transaction rates. So, okay, so we, we can define, make some simplifying definitions. Um, B can be thought as the ratio of the uh, MB or MN, and it can be thought as the percentage increase in the block weight when you mine an oversized block. So the penalty then can be reduced to the, ba the base reward times B squared. Always have the base reward in here, and B can be thought as the percentage increase in the block weight, and that's the penalty you to pay. So if you mine a block that's, say, 10% bigger, your penalty will be 1% of your block reward, regardless of the initial size of the block, of the, of the median. So then the next consideration that we get is what happens when we add a penalty attracting transaction, and then you do a bunch of formulas, and you essentially get that the additional transaction, as this formula here is R base times 2BBT, BT is a transaction uh, block weight, plus BT squared, and B is how much into the penalty you're already in. So that formula determines the fee that the miner will require from that transaction to include it. So that then defines our fees. And so you have two fees, basically the the median uh, for the calculation that we use for fees is the minimum of the long and short term medians. Um, and if you have your MF at the basic uh, 300,000 bytes, then in a two input to actual transaction, um, what you'll have is you use a reference of 3,000 bytes and that's just the typical transaction size plus a margin for safety. So that's defined by this minimum uh, penalty free block size of block weight, sorry, of 300,000 bytes and the typical transaction size. That's what determines your normal fee in Monero. And the key thing to understand is that the fee per byte is proportional to the ratio. So if you, for example, like it happened in 2018, if you lower the transaction uh, size by a factor of five, your fees actually go down by a factor of 25. And that's why we saw such a dramatic drop in fees when we went into bulletproofs. Because that's exactly what happened. The fee per byte drops by five, and then your size of the transaction also drops by five. So the overall fee drops by a factor of 25. Then the, the next fees are set up basically based on the normal fee. And so in summary, this is what you'll get you'll get the low fee is 0 0.02. Now remember, in every single of these calculations, our base is in there. Our base is your block reward. And this is very important to realize. Our base is always part of these calculations. And the other calculation come in is that median size of the block size. So if you make MF 10 times bigger, the fees per byte go down by a factor of 10. The transaction size stays the same. The block size is 10 times bigger your fees go down by a factor of 10. So now, you see low and high fees are arbitrary. They're based actually off the normal fee, and so that five spread. The highest fee is again the highest that you can get to max out the penalty to the extreme. That defines that fee. So fees on Monero are set by the penalty, the interaction of the penalty with the minimum penalty fee block size. That's what determines fees and they are driven by a free market. So what are the impacts of this change? Well, in 2019, we, we added the long-term median. It basically uh, increases the cost of a spammer by a factor of 50 times. It's a, a 50,000 block median. 
uh, of no penalty. So essentially what it does, it prevents a, a, a big bloating attacks while at the same time maintaining flexibility in the system that it will allow you to deal with, say, a Christmas season uh, in shopping. Where if you look at some of our major competitors, such as Visa, their numbers are roughly 20 times the average rate of transactions on a day like December 23rd. So you have to have taken into account, if you're going to play the transaction game in retail, you have to have the ability to scale on demand, to meet seasonal demand. And I'm not sure of any other coin that has actually gone to the trouble of building this in so that you have a system that allows you to run retail transactions. So we go back to the rational miner. They basically, uh, and users in Monero, they, they basically add transactions in, in order of profitability. And then you get, sorry, I'm going too fast here. And basically, again, the lowest fee is paid, is this formula. The lowest fee paid in transaction in the block is the one that is at the highest penalty level. So the miner makes a profit on the penalty. The fees tell the miner how far you wish to push the penalty in order to get there. The miners will make a profit, and there's a free market running the entire thing. Now, one of the things that are critical in this to understand is that the total fees per block are proportional to the block reward. And I want to reemphasize this. The amount of fees that a miner gets per block is proportional to the block reward. This is one thing you get out of this talk. This is very important. Because what happens when it goes to zero? So do the fees. It's that simple. They can, the miners can try to say, well, we're going to impose a minimum fee and protocol. It doesn't work. So now your Monero avoids it through this um, approach of saying we have a tail emission. That's why the tail emission is absolutely critical in Monero. Without it, it will not work. And the best example is Bitcoin, which have the same formula as Monero does. Well, the same before the, um, the long-term meetings were, were added in. And it has the problem that they had to abandon it and go to a miner setting the, the block size effectively to control the fees. So you're back again to the Bitcoin problem. You, you have to restrict that block size in order to get the fees to compensate the miners or to try to compensate the miners. And the scenario for, for Bitcoin is minor cartel then tragedy of the commons. We'll take a brief look at Bitcoin here. In my opinion, the fee market that was envisioned in Bitcoin, there is no, I have not seen any academic argument that says this is how it's supposed to work, what the game theory is, what the mathematics are. There was a comment made in the Satoshi paper. And that's it. That everybody is basically citing authority on. Um, but that's all we have. Now we take a look at some of the other ones. Bitcoin failed. Why? Because they had to keep the fees. They had to cause the fees to go up, restrict the block size, and that killed the transaction uh, as a transaction of currency. So basically, in order to have a success, you got to have a stiffer penalty than what you have in Monero. At least you have a chance, because we're showing it in Monero, it goes to zero. So basically, you have something stricter. And the approach taken in the Bitcoin community is this one megabyte block weight limit and their, and their block weight, which effectively is the most prudent approach, in my opinion, but it will not allow for a transactional currency. So we get the fox, Bitcoin SB, cremate humongous blocks but they still get less in transaction fees. Bitcoin Cash, 32 megabyte blocks, which by the way, if you compensate for Nielsen's law of bandwidth, that's actually smaller today than when the one megabyte block was introduced in 2010. And I get a sense of deja vu when I look at Bitcoin Cash. They're talking great things, but in reality, where is the code? Where is the formula? Has it been looked at? Can it be attacked? I would suggest yes. If you only have fees, which is the lowest day in the year that you will have um, less transaction flow, Christmas Day. So guess what? You want to attack a, a, a fee-only coin, you got to play Scrooge. And that's a, a theoretical attack. It won't work right now. 
so it's perfectly fine to disclose it, but let's wait a decade or two and take a serious look. If they don't do anything about it, will Bitcoin Cash be attackable? Will Bitcoin SP be attackable? And I would say they are. Maybe, let's say for the 200th anniversary of Charles Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol. Again, what I get is more questions than answers. So here are my conclusions. The, the tail emission in Monero is critical for the success of Monero. The Satoshi fee market is unproven and may not even work at all. Cryptocurrencies with a maximum number of coins and foreign broker worlds create more questions than real answers. And I think I'm just about on time. Thank you very much, Artic Mine. Um, we don't have time for questions. He used all of his allotted time. Uh, he should be available for questions off stage if you would like to discuss these things with him. Uh, we are going to get prepared for our next talk, which is in about five minutes. It's going to be talking about NIM from Harry Halpin or Haplin, one of those two. I, I, the LP, uh, I, I didn't quite get 100% which one that was. So let's go ahead and we're, gonna, we're getting the slides up, ready to go. Um, while that happens, again, feel free to talk with Arctic Mine about the uh, adaptive block weight of Monero. Once more, we've got the FOSS Asia stuff going on back there. Uh, if you want to go and talk with them about what they're doing in their workshop. Um, other than that, there's the entirety of C3 for you to enjoy. So I hope you guys are having a great time so far.